getting started. I was there at the dawn of the third age of mankind. Babylon 5 is open for business. Very often in television you have a pilot that dumps all the money into it. The series is a notch down below that. Here's been the exact opposite. We made a pact that we would make the series better than the movie. Know this. You are the right people. In the right place. At the right time. Babylon 5 is here to help keep the peace. It's all a game. No one here is exactly what he appears. I mean, we're not some deep space franchise. This station is about something. Phoenix Comic Con. I'm sorry I can't be there right now. I, uh, I'm a working actor and I got a job. <laughs> this oftentimes happens in the television industry. I want you to know that I was very much looking forward to this convention to be with all my friends and colleagues from Babylon 5. But believe me, they're a colorful crew and they will keep you thoroughly entertained. I love them all. I love you all. I wish I could be there, but Duty calls. Thank you very much. Have fun. This is the best you got for questions? You got this crew here, a lame question like that. There's scandal, there's intrigue, there's all kinds of stuff. How does the story change over time? It got better. Who out there thinks the question sucked? Moving on. We got a dead bee who couldn't show up. <laughs> what? I, uh, who says Bruce is a dead bee? Come on, raise your hand. That was a sh that sucked. Yeah. I would have shot that over. <laughs> I agree. Maybe this one will be better. <laughs> I have a question for Steven. What? I'm, I'm trying to talk to you, sir. Wake up. Monday yes. morning Hi. in America. What was the question? <laughs> what? Did you ever feel that you, through Veer you were the personification of Londo's conscience? Did I ever? <laughs> I can't hear. Uh, did the, we can't, we can't hear it's you. It's so reverberating. We should have a, a monitor yeah, a somewhere echo. pointed towards the stage. Did I ever feel like I was Londo's conscience? Um, yeah, I did. Uh, to me, I was comparing it to like um, Jiminy Cricket, you know, on the shoulder and talking to him, although he would never listen. Uh, so um, anyway, so, so that was it. But uh, should I, you know, it's funny because I had never done science fiction before. <laughs> and, and this was all new to me. And uh, I remember, um, I just got to tell you this story that I think you'll enjoy. Is um, I, I'm just going to go to sleep for this. <laughs> I, I've heard this a little bit. So I'm just going to nod out here. 40 so, weeks. For those of you who need to know, there's only 78 minutes and 53 seconds left of this shit. So, what is I'm looking at the clock right now. Anyway, I walked into the audition for Babylon 5. They had done the pilot and there was about 20 guys there. Uh, they all had their hair up, you know? And I, I, I knew I was missing something. I wasn't, my agent didn't tell me something that I should have done. So I ran to the men's room and I started to mold my hair up in the fan, you know, with the soap. And uh, the soap got into my eye and I started to tear and everything. And then I heard them call my name. So I went in and I, there was, 
you know, the producers there and everything. And um, I felt like I owed him an explanation. I, I got this mess of a hair and I'm tearing. My eyes are tearing and everything. And I said, you know, I am so sorry. I, I, I didn't know about the hair thing. And then I went into the bathroom and I got the soap and it, and it got in my eye. And the, they went, wait a second, it's Veer. It's exactly what happened. He was like, I don't know, it's, it's here. This actually goes out to the audio visual. If we can have the reverb turned down just a little bit, we're having a little bit of a difficulty on this side hearing uh, some of the questions. Perfect. <laughs> For us, it's almost impossible to hear anything. I mean, we, we don't hear anything, so we... No, we're better off not hearing each other, I've discovered. This is wonderful for us. Yeah, we went five seasons without listening to each other. Fuck yeah. <laughs> I really can't hear a thing, and I have, like, eagle ears. Are, are there more questions? Of course, Excellent. of course. The following one goes actually to uh, Robin. Yes, I, I already understand what you're going to ask. Byron was a noble, altruistic, and self-sacrificing character, but we didn't get to see much of his lighter side. Do you think he had one, or what would Byron have found funny? <laughs> you see, the problem was when I was called to, to Byron. You know, I, I was in South America. And they said, uh, we want you to do British accent. I said, I, I cannot. I was in the Pussy Boots, uh, the character. The lighter side, uh, I don't know. Um, you know, we wore a lot of Versace in, on the show. Um, and we were poor telepaths. So I always had a hard time getting around that uh, because we should have just sold off all our clothes. Uh, you know, I didn't think Then that. we could have afforded the home world. You're right. Right? Or sold your hair, we could have done that. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I don't think I answered the question, but... <laughs> he showed his lighter side uh, when the camera was not rolling, may I say. <laughs> a lot of that. Yeah. So there are some background little stories, I'm assuming, behind the scenes. There are weird, many background stories. That was from over here somewhere. That was interesting. <laughs> well, probably the best time, of, as I recall, of your relationship on screen... Oh, boy. Oh, Lord. Um, we ha you know what a closed set is? We only have a crew that's needed there and no one else. We're having one of the, uh, how shall we say, lovemaking scenes. Why did you write me a nude scene when I was 42 years old and had been breastfeeding? <laughs> why, why did Comedic you do that to me? Comedic. Yeah, and we, and we were told it was uh, going to be a closed set, and that yeah. was the day that all the producers showed up exactly. to the... <laughs> Warner, so there, there, she's going almost next to nothing. And it's a closed set. It was nothing. It was, it was nothing. nothing. Damn, I missed that. And <laughs> Doug Netter, one of the producers on the show, has Warner Brothers executives coming for a tour. And in the middle of this scene, in come five guys in suits. <laughs> and you're trying to be sincere in what's going on. Well, but Pam, uh, we had our first AD was, um, we had two first ADs. They alternated episodes and they made sure that the female first AD was on the set for the nude scene. And uh, Pam was blocking the way, and she said, nobody can come on the set unless you take your, all your clothes off. And Jerry went, I'm there. <laughs> so, so the only word that I could make out out of all of that was breasts. <laughs> could the sound guy put our microphones into the monitors a little bit? Because we truly cannot hear, cannot anything, hear anything anyone is saying. So... Sam coming from this, but none of them. Thank you. We have the moderators in the monitor, but we don't have ourselves in the monitor. And mm -hmm. since we'd be, it would be much we better if hear, we could hear ourselves. We can hear the gentleman at the end well. really well, but we can't hear a word anybody else is saying. And we paid our money too. What if we turn? <laughs> Billy? <laughs> Billy? These are floor monitors in front of us, and if we could turn these to us, the musicians in the room will understand. All right, man. Thank you. I dig it. I dig it. 
You're welcome. Yeah, and turn Thank the clock you. around so they see how long they oh, have to baby. suffer through this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't. Yeah, yeah don't give us the clock. Don't ever give actors the clock. Almost over, clock. folks. Almost over. Seventy-three minutes. Seventy-three minutes in hell. Hey, oh, it's hot, but it's not hell. Yeah, note I'm to self: those are floor monitors. We never did. I know. It's fine. Who wants to start over? Yeah. <laughs> all right, let's all go off stage. Everybody, get up. Right. We're gonna start up now. <laughs> I like the intro. Yeah. Let's do that five times and we're out of here. I want Stephen to tell the casting story again. Could no, Stephen on. tell the casting story again? Yeah, That'd be all right. Do that. Yeah. It's a sixth time I've yeah. heard it. <laughs> I kind of don't want to ask this question next because it's serious. We'll make it not serious. Just go ahead. Yeah. Uh, okay. We'll make fun of it a lot. Well, then it's for Claudia. Oh, it's definitely not going to be serious now. Go ahead. <laughs> within obviously, a few... obviously, you haven't read my book. <laughs> yes. Okay. Within a few short weeks, you filmed Ivanova's breakdown. A 50-year-old General Ivanova attending Sheridan's farewell dinner, and then an 18-year-old Ivanova about to join the military. Was it difficult to transition between these three stages? No, because I think Ivanova was always an 18-year-old stuck in a 60-year-old's body anyway, so there it doesn't go. really... <laughs> um, the ferret wig was the most difficult part of that all, that, that whole thing. I believe that they were trying to cast somebody that was 18 to play me at 18, and I had to bring in a headshot proving that I really hadn't aged that much. I mean, that I didn't look that much older than I would have. I was only 20, 27, and the character was 10 years younger. Yeah, so you I look went into super the, fine, baby. Oh, thank you, baby. I, I, yeah, I especially like people who come up and say, you still look good. No, so listen, so, so I'm talking. <laughs> so, you know I love her, that's why. I do. Um, no, so I went into the casting office, and I was all in a huff. And I said, uh, you know, why, why, why are you trying to find somebody that's, I mean, I haven't, look, look at, here's my eight by 10 from when I was 18, here's the one nowadays. And on the counter, I saw everything from like, Asian girls, <laughs> Hispanic girls. That was, was the, just Joe's porn. I, I think they were pulling my chain. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was wrong? a harem that was coming in later on for the cast. No, I don't know what the thing was. No, but to answer your question, it, no, it wasn't very difficult at all because, um, like I said, I think that she was probably mature when she was young as Great. well. Thank as you. See, Jerry and I were just talking about this. We're, we're taking over the fucking town, just so you understand that. Go for it. Because this is, we're sorry, but these are... Yeah, you, you can listen to NPR anytime. Uh, so who wants to chime in? What was the most annoying part of being on Bad One Five? The most ridiculous well, part? Well, we will look The makeup! No bottled the water. water. The latex! Cups. The fish meals. <laughs> Coming from the man who had clam chowder in Arizona <laughs> last night in May. <laughs> Worshipping the porcelain god. Danger. Danger. Night Danger. Night. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And why right. was he in your room that you would know that? See, when you have a telepathic ability, it doesn't oh. happen to you. What was no, the least fun girl. part, the most fun part for you guys? The so character. The part of working for me. I mean, you know. Gills. Gills? Gills. Getting, getting surprise scripts from you and not getting any explanation. What, what am I wearing fucking gills for? And you're like, what is that <laughs> shit? Hey, hey, Pat, Pat, how about this? Oh, I'm gay. Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, yeah, right? Now, don't you pull that shit on me, because... I, I walked out, I was going to introduce the line of, uh, of Talia and Ivana being involved no, in a relationship. No, you told me about that. It didn't, I, it, you didn't tell them. <laughs> well, I walk, I walk out onto the set and go to these two ladies and say, and they're setting up for the next lighting scene. Yeah, you know where this is going. Yeah. I, I said, are, are you two okay with playing? And, and I said, I'm 16 years old inside my body. And it was more like, I, 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 I'm thinking of making you guys like in a, in a thing together with each other and with that, that, is that okay and you know, and they said and Claudia says like this and they begin making out Those on the, the good set old days. all construction stops all movement stops 
it is the most wonderful floor show in the history of Babylon 5. It was pretty damn good for me too, Joe. And, and you that's, that's guys really I, committed to this. That's not how I this. remember it though. I remember Jerry coming to me and going, did you hear? And I'm like, what Doyle like, hated me for about you eight years. No, no, no. Because I wouldn't let you watch. You two, <laughs> you two would be in the jacuzzi drinking champagne while I was acting my ass off on a cul-de-sac next to an Orange Julius factory and calling up and going, they need to talk to you right away. Dre needs to talk to you right away. So I'd be like, okay, finish the scene. If I run and go grab a set phone, I'd go, whoa, what's going on? What's going on? Oh, we're just in the jacuzzi drinking champagne, makeup. And I'm like, well, fuck the both of you. you know, I, and they probably did, I don't know. Uh, those were the good old days. Right. This has gotten blue really fast, oh, hasn't it, folks? This okay. is what they want. Are there children here? There are. My there own are. child is here. I'm just like, oh my You're God. You're going to be scarred. <laughs> Get used to it. The world's Peter. fucked anyway. <laughs> That's why we're leaving. Babylon 5, 2256. One trip. Get your luggage. Let's get the fuck out of here. <laughs> So I'll be explaining this for years uh, to my ch my ten year old. Yeah, so where you you had the exposure to all the fandom before any of this started? What, what was your first reaction? Y you, yeah. She's over here. Yeah. Okay. You, 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 you play me at a yeah. The, the very first convention that we went to, you were exposed to the fandom for the first time. I remember a, a person in the audience. You were new to American culture as well. One of the first questions you got at a small convention was, "Saint Moose and Squirrel." <laughs> Yeah, that's right. And you said? <laughs> and, and I said, moose and squirrel. <laughs> so, so how was it entering the world of fandom for you? How's this been over the no, years? No, I, I, I remember uh, somebody from the audience, I, I was telling them the story of the war and how I, you know, I, I lost my country, basically, and my family and so on and so on, my family of actors and my, my whole world. And somebody from the audience said, welcome to your new family. And uh, it stuck with me and it became truth, you know. I really, I really was uh, welcome to this new family and I appreciate it very, very much. Isn't it nice when we get to sit down when Mira starts to talk? Because Joe would write her three and a half page scenes. And you'd be standing there for four hours while Mira was going far, far away and a long time ago. We'd be like... <laughs> Our stand-ins quit. That's why Sorry I did it. Sorry to have bored you so much. But now, on the other hand, we have um, Walter and Bill who have been around fandom for a long time. So uh, for you two, and I've always said, you know... Oh, Walter's over there? I can't see him. <laughs> Hello, Walter. <laughs> You were hiding behind Mira. So, I mentioned in a previous convention, you know, Star Trek became this huge monolithic success and, and took off for many years. And then B5 came along and did really well. I think it's basically the only common denominator is you. So it's your responsibility. So for you and, you and Bill, how is it coming out of that fandom into this fandom? Has it been different? Has it been an exploration for you? How's it, what's your reaction to all this? When you said uh, Walter and Bill, I thought you were talking about Bill Shatner. Uh, ouch, man. A surprise guest, ladies and gentlemen. Who? <laughs> He's a douchebag. How can he? <laughs> you guys turn on a dime, don't you? They're vicious. Wait, maybe we can uh, beam him up. <laughs> Scotty Bunch. Scotty. Have you been that's waiting all weekend one. to pull that out? I remember when Walter showed up the first day on the first time it was playing Fester, we came to the lunch table and we all stood up exactly. in deference to a senior officer. Yeah. Well, I think I should, I think I should pass this on to Billy. Having uh, survived the uh, 60s sci-fi scene where... Uh, you know, we responded to uh, guys in bad rubber suits on, uh, on Babylon 5. We were responding to guys in uh, good rubber suits. <laughs> so that was a, a big difference. But in terms of the whole sci-fi fandom, although uh, 
Walter and I had been going to cons for probably a good 10 years before Babylon 5 really came onto the air, there is a big difference in the way uh, conventions and, and fans are so organized now and, and people buy your autograph. I can't imagine having sold my autograph you know, in the 60s and 70s and here we are doing that now. And that's a little weird, but it's, it's good as long as you guys are happy and, and we're happy. And uh, I'm proud to be a part of uh, the 60s sci-fi and proud to be a part of Babylon 5. Thank you, Joe. So Peter, a lot of people don't know how it is we ended up with your hair being quite that long, which was never intended originally to be quite that long. It was going to be actually shorter and refined. You want to tell them how this actually happened? Does anyone not know this story? Okay, this is a true Five story. Five people, go ahead. When, you, when, when I went to the audition for Londo, they had a little drawing of, of Londo, and I guess the other characters too, and Londo had little tiny short hair like uh, like the emperor guy used to wear and so when we got the uh, got to the first day of shooting the uh, the wonderful hair uh, optic nerve decided to comb the the wig all the way out and they make wigs really long for you know so they can cut them back before they give them, they, they pulled the hair all the way up and we thought wow that looks really funny let's go show that to Joe <laughs> and of course Joe was sitting in a little office typing the scene we were gonna do tomorrow and uh, we didn't really want to bother. We just opened the door and said, hey, Joe, we thought we'd go with hair like this. What do you think? And he looked up from him and said, yeah, that looks good. Go with that. <laughs> and of course, the joke was on me. <laughs> right? So. You had to wear it for the next five years. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. See, being new to producing, I, didn't, I thought what an actor is comfortable with is what the actor should be able to do. And I thought you were most comfortable with that. And who knew the practical joke? It was the first of many jokes that I told over the years that Joe didn't get. <laughs> Do you have a good question to ask? Oh, that was a good question. A smart, informed, funny, dangerous, uh -oh. resourceful question. You are Hurry, making him flip, sweat. flip, find something. Don't take account this personally, for you guys, really. You're an accountant, account for yourself. Joe. <laughs> you sent out a script with uh, Jakar's sex change with an intimate scene with Lando. Did the response of the cast and crew surprise you? Do you all know this story? Well, there you go. How many now do you know this story? This is a good story. This yeah, is this, a good is a, story. this is a good one. Yeah. A real and good, good story. Is, we can have all the cast dial in at the appropriate moments. You guys can nap while I set this up. It's okay. <laughs> so we're at a convention. It was in, in Pasadena, I believe, right? Um, the creation convention or something like that. Yeah. And, and. Yeah, you Yeah, you tell you part of it. Come on. It was one of the very first Babylon 5 conventions, and Andreas and I thought that it would be funny. And uh, again, another joke that um, <laughs> we thought would be funny. But what would be really funny is that when they introduced Joe, because we went on before Joe, we said, uh, when Joe comes out and they say, and here he is, the creator of Babylon 5, just don't applaud at all and, and don't laugh at any of his jokes. So we thought that would be funny. And, um, and so when Joe's time came, we ran out to the audience, Andreas and I, and watched this. And you know what? It was really funny. <laughs> it was great. They said, and here he is, the creator of Babylon 5, Joe Michael Straczynski. And he came out and it was perfectly quiet. And it was great to see Joe with a lot of flop sweat, because, you know, I had had plenty, but it was great to see him stand there. And he said, hi, I'm, I'm the creator of Babylon 5. Nothing. <laughs> and he said, I'm the writer. I'm Joe Michael Stinsky. Nothing. And, 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 <laughs> anyway, Andreas and I just thought that was the funniest thing in the world. And it then went what on happened? For almost 10 minutes. He, he really died out there. It was great. <laughs> and then what happened, Joe? It was the most horrific thing. I'm sweating, and, and it's awful. And then, then the two of them leap up onto the stage, explain it was all a joke, and on the way back say, nothing personal, of course. Now, I'm Russian. 
There's a reason to this day Stalingrad strikes fear into Germans. <laughs> and I said, we realized this means war. But you can't do it too fast. You have to wait. You have to plan it out. So I let a month go by, another month, three months, four months went by. We had the Christmas party. Andreas comes over and says, you know, how you doing? And that whole business of the convention, we're all over that, right? Oh, yeah, we're done with that. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I'm a dead man, aren't I? He says, no, it's fine, really. Yeah. <laughs> time goes on. And finally, time for my revenge. And I write a scene in a script in which we see your car in his quarters talking to someone. I think it's talking to you, as a matter of fact. Yeah. And he begins, <laughs> he begins having palpitations and collapses to the ground. They rush him to the med lab. We see you know, his body covered by a sheet, and something's happening to him. It, it's moving. What we discover is his species, when they get overly stressed, change genders. <laughs> Cut away. Come back. His car's gone. Cut to Londo's quarters. He wakes up, middle of the night, and there is Jakar saying to him, in female form, saying, as a male, I could never forgive you. As a female, I can forgive you. And a lot of us are like, <laughs> you, and you, you conquered my world, but you never conquered me. <laughs> and lays a kiss on Londo, who thinks, wait, this ain't bad. Because let's be honest, Londo would fuck a hole in the ground. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Cut away. Come back. They're in bed in the afterglow. And they're saying, you know, the was saying, sorry, I was all six. Was it okay? Sorry, um, it was all right. It was fine. Don't worry about it. And <laughs> how tired are you? Not that tired. We cut away. <clears throat> so on a Monday, the script goes out. First thing I say, I walk onto the set, and there's a cast member, a female cast member coming toward me saying, you know, I want to thank you for that script. I have friends who are transgenders. No one understands them. <laughs> really sincere, almost in tears. And the first person to show up is Jerry, <laughs> who said he happened to be in the area. <laughs> Jerry, des describe the area. <laughs> Maybe in a couple hours away. <laughs> no, I'm uh, uh, what's around the stages. There's an orange bang factory. Yeah, the orange bang factory. A gravel pit. The gravel pit. Uh, the, junkyard. The junkyard and uh, there's the no around wire. to be there. Yeah, and I was, there was a nice taqueria that was, that was out there. It's just, it just in the neighborhood. And he says, I read the script, it's a great gag. And I said, it's not a gag, we're shooting it. You know in the Warner Brothers cartoons where a kid goes, boop, and it's like a thing of dust in their shape if they're gone? That was, that was Jerry. <laughs> Gotta see it. Peter comes by later. Joe, I got the script. You said, yeah, I got the script. Am I not lying? I got the script. Great, great gag. Says, no, we're shooting. And now I get the line that I've been sitting on for five months. <laughs> I'm writing every episode of the show, producing every episode. I don't have time to write something. We're not going to shoot. We're shooting it. <laughs> <Boop>. <laughs> now, I turn it over to, as I understand it, a small insurrection began amongst the cast. Who wants to talk about that? Well, I can say that, that Bruce called me, and we figured Joe was, you know, he had written how many scripts in a row up at this point? So we just thought he was just out of his mind. And he had slipped away, and Bruce called me really seriously one night and said, you know, Peter, we really got to do something about this. This is, uh, this is not good, this script. And I remember Mira saying, it's horrible, Peter. It's horrible what, what Joe has done. And, of course, Andreas didn't believe it. He didn't believe it at, at, at all until you, you ordered that, that he be fitted for breasts, right? Yes. They had I, the costume people fit him for new large breasts. You must understand, the crew always took me seriously. We were going to start with the Len as, as male, who's going to become female. So that they knew that was, that was the plan at one point, so they figured, well, he was just following up a previous thread. So I call in wardrobe. I said, I want proper design for, you know, a nice dress for Jakar. Bring him in for a <laughs> fitting. Give me some options, and they're writing everything down furiously. I call Optic Nerve, our prosthetics guys, and say, I want a full chest cast of Andreas, <laughs> for which they have to shave his chest. <laughs> and whatever else you need to shave, just do it. <laughs> which is quite popular these days. Yes, I understand. 
And I kept hearing insurrection rumors coming back from the castle. Like over five days. And on Friday, I put out the proper script. And I come back into the stage, see that same production woman coming toward me. So I feel so betrayed. Right? <laughs> and I never hear from Andreas this entire time until the following Monday. I'm walking across the parking lot where we had our food every day. Let me find this here. Hang on one second. Yeah, I got something. Right. Leave those alone. Those are credit cards. You Joe's know, address is... You know what happened the last time with you and credit cards. It didn't work out well for anybody. It's a nice picture, Joe. Thank you. Do you have one of you? Oh! So I could do that now because he's not writing my lines anymore. <laughs> it be... was in here somewhere. Hold on. May talk? What's that round oh circle? Bill Pat. Oh, <laughs> Probably expired. <laughs> that was easy. I can't find it. I used to carry it with me. That was too easy, I, wasn't it? I carried this with me for years. So I can't find it now. Uh, little, he says, a little tiny newspaper clipping, my picture on it, where it says, five years or nothing, the quote be saying. And Andrea says, I've carried this for four years. You can have it now. <laughs> and hands it to me and walks away. I realized he, I, I have no idea what the hell that meant. And I still don't, which was his winning the argument. Okay, this, this coming from the guy that never said a word to me for about three years. we just pass each other while he was smoking, and I'd say, you know, I'd wave, and he'd just nod. So I invite him to my 30th birthday, and what does he give me as a gift? Licorice underwear. Was it good? <laughs> You're going to have to ask him. <laughs> the whole point of edible underwear, what? Joe, is to get a partner to was eat it off. <laughs> so, oh. he, so he was first in line, you're saying? <laughs> it was a long line. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not go there, folks. Remember, Julie Caitlin Brown's son is in the audience. She has enough to explain to him. I'm in big trouble. <laughs> there he is, right in the front row. He's enjoying it immensely. I know, Max. Just shut your ears, will you? Yeah. It's okay, Max. <laughs> yeah. I, I'd say that was such a good question. We should give him a crack at another one, huh? Okay. Yeah. yeah. A really, a really go good, ahead. solid, really good, smart She's question. No pressure. We're all looking at you. We really don't. No, your questions are better. Go. No, no, no. We're no. giving you a chance to redeem yourself. Okay, you shouldn't blame me. Blame them. They're their questions. Oh, look at that. Are these the audience questions? You see that? Wow. She turned on God, you. God, she. You could be Wait. in Congress. I. I, I got to say on that script thing, I re I read the script and I went, God, I wish I had that part. Because I, I thought it was very cool, and I loved it, you know? <laughs> he, he, he didn't have to kiss Andreas at all, of course. So. Yes, of course he thought it was cool. But, but you did. When we did the, um, the, the Blackpool convention, you and Andreas acted that scene out, and you did smooch. Yeah, they did. And there were tongues involved. And, and what of it, Joe? <laughs> no, nothing, Peter. Nothing, nothing. <laughs> The guy could really kiss, what can I say? <laughs> he was Greek. <laughs> Andreas was Jakar. Yes, it's true. The Northridge earthquake hit in, what was it, 1994? I think yeah. it was something like that, yes. 1994? Yeah, when they left Total the devastation. Starving. He lived in Northridge, almost at the epicenter. His house had cracks in the floor. He had stone floors. His house had cracks in the walls. His windows were cracked. The doors wouldn't close just exactly right. Some of the cabinets in the kitchen were a little askew. He got the settlement money from the insurance company, and he put it in the bank. And he lived with cracks in the floor, and cracks in the walls, and cracks in the windows. And so who cares if the cabinets don't close right? He was perfectly happy as things were, and he was that guy. He was. Jakar, or Jakar was him, and yeah. just a phenomenal human being. Well, Jerry, 
Didn't you and Andreas live together for a while? Andreas and I did live together for a while. Uh, yeah. He, he used to tell me a story like walking in and seeing you watching sports in your underwear and just being awful. Yeah, when you chain smoke and watching sports, you know, it's, it's a great game. Um, I'll tell you a quick story about Andres. Cheapest son of a bitch on the planet. He used to put himself on an allowance. It was $60 a week. That was food, that was gas, that was cigarettes. Most of it was cigarettes and coffee. And if he didn't make it, he didn't spend more money. He would craft service or you know, whatever he had to do to get by. He, right, he was the cheapest son of a bitch on the planet. And he had a lot of money. Not because of what they paid him. <laughs> but um, when I moved in, he didn't have anything in the cupboards. He was like old Mother Hubbard. So I went to Ralph's and I bought like, I don't know, five or $600 worth of groceries. Filled the refrigerator, filled all the cabinets. He comes home from the set, like, honey, I'm home. And he goes in the kitchen and every drawer, everything he opens up, there's food. And he's like, where'd, where'd this food come from? I go, the food fairy. I don't know. <laughs> and he's like, wow. And he's like, oh, he, was, he was like, oh, what are we having for dinner? And he used to write down on his diary everything I made for dinner. And then he would like critique it. <laughs> yeah. He had like a spreadsheet. So I go, I'm on the set, <laughs> we're shooting a scene, he's not on the set that day, and they say, Jerry, uh, Andy Kay needs to talk to you right away. Uh, all right, so we finish the scene, I pick up the phone, I go, what's up? He goes, you get the ham? I go, what? He goes, you went to Ralph's, right? I go, yeah. He goes, well, if you spent more than like 50 bucks, they gave you free ham. And I go, it's $500 worth of fucking groceries in the house, are you worried about a fucking ham? And he goes, they give you free ham, I want the free ham. And I, I said, you didn't buy the food. I bought the food. I'm not worried about the ham. Don't be worried about the ham. So I come home from the set, and he goes, you got the receipt? I go, what receipt? I kid you not. I don't have the receipt. He goes, D how'd you pay? Cash? No. Credit card. He goes, you going to get the statement? I go, yeah. He goes, I I'm going to get that ham. <laughs> he goes down to Ralph's, and he talks to the manager at Ralph's. And he says to the guy, and he, and he has, I, I, he says to the guy, why would I lie to you about a ham? <laughs> and he goes through this whole big story, and he finally he comes back, he's all in a huff, he goes, I'm never shopping at Ralph's again, it's like a son of a bitch, blah, blah, blah. And he goes, you sure you don't have the receipt? I go, I don't have the receipt. I go to the set the next day, he's not shooting, must have been mad at him. Um, and I come home from the set, his car's in the garage, I walk in the house, yo, Andy. Nothing. Living room, and nothing. Nothing. Walking through the house, where the fuck is he? I open the side door off the kitchen. He's got the entire trash can emptied out on the ground. He's sitting on the step with his hands with coffee grounds on them, going through the trash, trying to find the receipt. Kid you not, he looks at me and he says, if you ever tell anybody this story, I will kill you. <laughs> he never got the ham. Never got the ham. He's, it killed him that he didn't. It was a five dollar and ninety nine cent piece of garbage butt ass ham. But because he didn't get it, he. I don't think he's resting comfortably at this point in his life. I really don't. One I'm, more quick insight into uh, Andreas Katsoulis. Uh, all of us went to a convention in, in England, in Blackpool, and there was a group photograph that we uh, all were in together, and there was a long queue, and we were all like this, actually, we were lined up together, and there's a long queue to get this picture autographed by all of us, and I was actually sitting next to, uh, actually, I was between Andreas and Jeff Conaway, and so we're all signing the pictures, <laughs> and I was after Andreas, and I noticed that he was signing the pictures, Queen Elizabeth, Madonna, Madonna Lady, Lady, Di. Lady, Di. Lady Di, this was before the accident, Lady Di, and finally I'd say to him, dude, they, these people are paying a lot of money for this, and he'd go, oh, all right, and then he'd start writing Andreas, and I'd say, come on, can't they get the Katsulis? And he'd say, no. And one in every 20, he might give you Andy Kay. Right. Yeah. 
but uh, he did. I, he I, was I, a quirky cat, man. Th there was a lot of people that, that they, one lady had this entire photo with every single person who ever worked on Babylon 5 in the history of Babylon 5. Giant photo, and he actually wrote Madonna on it. Yeah. And, and she was devastated. She was in tears. She was crying. She was the, I, I said, no, you can get it off with acetone. Just, just nail polish remover. You can just take it off. She was devastated. He, yeah, he was just a quirky, quirky yep. guy. Good blues so, singer, though. Yeah, damn good. A question for actually and for Jason and for Tracy. Uh, you guys came into uh, basically a running operation as, as cast members was already in place and you walked in. Was it particularly difficult for you guys to come in when you did? When to you, come... Oh I, oh, I can speak. <laughs> uh, um, to come to the show, it was, um, it was, it was, it was a surprise because I auditioned for you, and as far as my agent was concerned, it was for uh, a, a guest. And then I got the call from my agent saying, "Oh, you've got the job. It's for three years." What? And I've, I've never, sorry, as an actor, you don't get a job for more than a month, two months. I've never, you know, even a theater play. Oh, you do it like eight months running a show if it's successful. But uh, this was like, what? An idea that I'm going to work. And then coming in, the worst thing, because I hadn't seen the show apart from a little bit, is that I'm going for my wardrobe fitting because it was quite quick. And I, I, I look terrible in Lycra. <laughs> Because I knew it was science fiction. I'm just not going to look good in it. And then I get to the wardrobe fitting, and I've got this bloody Shakespearean robe. And uh, <laughs> I, I'm golden. I'm good on that one. It's in the book, actually, isn't it? Me showing off with the vampire thing. But everyone was so nice to me. And it, was, um, it wasn't that scary at all. And it was straight into it, wasn't it? And then I had the opening scene, which was really good. Thank you very much. It's the best entrance I could have had. You know, like, there I am, all sweaty in a spaceship. And... I don't know, I felt good. I felt good about it. And then, um, and then there was this black guy dude, Richard Biggs, who <laughs> befriended me. Um, one of the best of people, best of people, so I miss him greatly, and a lovely, lovely man, great actor. That's all I say. So I really, I really was happy. I was like, yes, I whined it because I was still insecure, and I thought, when am I going to get a chair? <laughs> Everybody had a chair, but I didn't have a chair with your name on it. You know, that kind of crap that, hey. Well, when we knew you wanted it, we couldn't give it to you after that. <laughs> yeah, I worked out the general dynamic of the show later on. <laughs> I want never gets. <laughs> Tracy? For me, it was both difficult and easy because I was already a fan um, I, I think most, most people who know anything about me professionally know that I'm a huge geek. And um, I was a fan of the show. I started watching the show actually because of Claudia. And um, I really wanted the part. And I think Joe knows and, and Jerry knows because he was at my final audition that I really wanted the part. So that part was difficult. And Joe told Jerry on my final audition, he said, he said, you know what, she's just, and correct me if I'm wrong, Joe, but I think you told Jerry, this is what I'm told, she, she's, just, she's just too, see if you can get to her, you know? Yeah, get push her, her. Push, push her, her yeah. get her in her face, say the line's wrong, mess with her, step on her, do, do whatever you have to do to shake her, because we gotta make sure that she's got the stuff. And um, Jerry said something to me like, I think you need some, to get some decaf, and I said, I think you need to kiss my Texas ass. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> and they went back and forth with this, and I recall the last line from you as you walked out the door was, lick me twice. Oh, that's right. Jerry thought he had the last, th okay, keep, wait, I, let me just, I'll be quick, but um, <laughs> all the suits from TNT and Warner Brothers, they were all in the room, it was all the big cheeses. And, and I, we're, we're carrying on like this. And Jerry wanted, tried to have the last word and said, bite me. I'm like, lick me twice. <laughs> and I walked out of the room and I'm told that Jerry turned to Joe and said, I vote her the least likely to go to bed with me, but probably the best captain. <laughs> And was, and was right on both counts. That's absolutely right. Exactly. Still time. Well, no, you, you, no, you were, 
of that group, I mean, come on, Catherine Oxenberg? Okay, sorry. But, um, uh huh. Yeah. While, while I have Jason's attention, which is hard to do in the best of days, um, <laughs> I, I want to resolve something between you and Bill that came up at the dinner the other day. So we, we have a difference of opinion on how this all went down. Uh, yeah. Bill. I have the truth. Well, no. <laughs> and, and you got your version. <clears throat> we, we were, I was in my office and Bill came by and I said, you know, I know that, we know that Jason was very insecure about having a chair. So I said to Bill, just like for a minute or two, wind him up that his character is going to get killed off. So, take it. Well, I said like five minutes. So we, uh, you didn't clarify a time. So, uh, <laughs> so we're going to uh, have a snack over at the, the lunch table and I, I walk up to Jason and, yes, he does. and I say, hey Jason, I, you know, I'm sorry about Marcus, and he goes, what do you mean? And I, I said, uh, you know, the, I, I read the next script. He said, what are, you, what are you talking about? And I said, hey, you know, nothing lasts forever, buddy. <laughs> and he says, well, what, 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 what exactly are you saying? I just bought a car. <laughs> and, uh, it, it, Take, well, take well, it, Joe. Well, I, be, when well, he came, I, I, can, I can take a bit of what you said because you're coming to me with that, that, that kind of like, what? I think you even asked me, have you read the next script? What? Oh, no, no, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> you, you actually milked it for a lot longer before I, I go. Oh, I, I did. I, I'm, I'm going. Eight hours. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? Before I actually got the, well, you know, things happen. You, 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 you bled it out to like, I was absolutely, what the hell is going on here? But you see, as, as, as Joe wrote for Lanier, understanding is not required, only <laughs> obedience. <laughs> now, I, I, I chose not to react for a while. I chose not to react for a while. I didn't know. I did. As, I, think as I, did. I understand. Also, Claudia at one point jumped in. Did you yes, not? Yes, Claudia did. I, I was very bad. I joined the party big time. Yes. In fact, I take complete responsibility for the whole thing. Uh, even though it wasn't my idea in the first place, but I always tell people it was because I thought it was so funny. Afterwards, it wasn't funny because Jason was really upset. And he, ah, said, he no. said, I've got a family. <laughs> and that's, that's when I started thinking to myself, maybe it's gone too far, but you didn't think it had gone quite far enough. I had well, played Anthony Fremont in the past. No. Um, well, what, I, what I heard was you were sitting in the chair as this is all going on and Jason's sp spinning higher and higher, higher into the atmosphere. And you said, lay Dom Sinclair. <laughs> I did, I did. No, but, we, we but, also mentioned the guy that was sucked out of the airlock after being a dink. But yes. here's yes. The, the, great, the great synchronistic part of this junior high school joke, which I'm certainly not proud to be a part of, is Jason comes to the office to find out what the hell is going on here. Right. And as Joe's assistant is typing next week's script, Jason comes up and looks at what she's writing on the computer screen. Actually, what she, she had left it there. She walked out of the room and left it there. And, and the line that was said? on screen, if I'm not correct, is Marcus steals himself for the death blow. <laughs> it was a fight with Naroon, the big Naroon fight. And, and, and I, I, heard think, look, I think we Jason? better be careful because Jason's melting down now. No, I'm not, I, I'm not melting down. I want to say that my experience of it, because I was on the end of it, is that I get the script and eventually get the script. I thought I, I was still, when I went to see the script supervisor or uh, look at it, and, uh, and it wasn't clear, but I'd seen that much. And then I get the script delivered and I'm reading the script uh, and get the, uh, got, get the whole script. And you get the death blow, you get this, and it's all going to happen, it's all going down. And then in the script that everyone's... <laughs> in the script that's been written, it says at the end of that scene uh, that, 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 that Marcus, Marcus opens one eye, I believe. Is <laughs> you can relax now, Jason. <laughs> that's all right. That's all in right. In the script. But I Bill, got mine in the as you can season. see, I wasn't, I wasn't quite as affected as um, Americans seem to think because I'm a sturdy Brit. We went through the war. Um, 
it the hard way. We were bombed. Um, and uh, it's true. It's in the blood. And, uh, and then I have to say, the guilt was so intense, apparently, amongst the people who were the protagonists of this particular gag, yeah. that I was surprised when suddenly there's a delivery at my house and there's a big basket, you know one of those big baskets full of stuff that you'd never buy but it's quite nice? One of those <laughs> baskets with, you know, we're sorry, thank you very much, signed a card and they thought, I was very sweet, I thought, fucking yeah, I got a big basket of shit. <laughs> Play a trick on me again. <laughs> I was, I was all right. I was all right. It didn't you scar what, me. You know what was on the card? The thing that I was angry about, the thing that I was upset me about was the gag was extended for so long. <laughs> you know, like, like, okay, we hoist someone up and then we just hoist them and then we pin them there and then we nail them there. Ha, 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 I never got it. You remember? <laughs> I, I never, you... I didn't want to speak to you, Billy. This was, I'm friends with Billy, uh, uh, you know, we, uh, but, but I didn't want to speak. I mean, I despised it. I mean, I was so incredibly uh, I think hurt. It was you, it was you who beginning. motivated it, wasn't I, it? I, I, I don't understand those things. I just don't. What's the enjoyment of, of, no. of, of playing with somebody and with play, playing with somebody's life? I don't get it. Sorry, I don't get it. She yeah, made but, me yeah, feel worse than in. slime. It's so tall. Yeah, but <laughs> wait a minute. Uh, may may I just interject one little thing, Mira? Yeah. You never spent mornings in the human makeup trailer. <laughs> Maybe that's it. Yeah. yeah. Different world. <laughs> and that moral core is why you played Delenn, because you were always a noble one. Delenn would never play a practical joke. Lanier wouldn't understand the practical joke. I, I never played a practical Woo -hoo. joke. Woohoo! On anybody. <laughs> I, I knew, I knew if they You're put still us on these couches. About it. I know, I'm still upset. I knew it's if they only put been us on twenty these, years. It's very strange, but I'm still upset Let's, about it. We need an exorcism. <laughs> yeah, Joe? it's okay. Let's smoke a joint. I was gonna say I, I knew if they put us on these couches, this would turn into a. It's quite obvious that there were problems with him uh, from, from the get go. And Rick was a terrific guy. He was a loving guy. In fact, whenever we we uh, met, he would kiss me, and I would seriously kiss me on the cheek. And I, at, at first, I felt, "Well, this is a little uncomfortable." Because he was black. <laughs> oh. Five years of this. Five years. That was too easy. <laughs> and then one time, uh, he didn't. He didn't kiss me. And I realized that I missed it. <laughs> I was used to it by that time. And I was thinking, why, why isn't he kissing me? <laughs> this is the perfect opportunity for our memorial video. No, really. We are gathered here today to honor our fallen comrades and their names. From the stars we came to the stars we returned. From now until the end of time. I believe that when we leave a place, part of it goes with us, and part of us Go anywhere in the station, and it is quiet. And just listen. After a while, you will hear the echoes of all our conversations, every thought and word we've exchanged. Long after we are gone, our voices will linger in these walls for as long as this place remains. Zathras does not want to die, but if it is the only way that Zathras dies, it is life. This place, every part of this station has somebody's fingerprints on it. Layers, layers, people's lives. 
There were times I thought none of us would get out alive. Some of us didn't. But we did everything we said we were gonna do. And nobody can take that away from us. I'm trying to tell you that what makes us human is that we care. And because we care. We never stop trying. People come to doctors because they want us to be gods. They want us to make it better. Or make it not so. They want to be healed. And they come to me when their prayers aren't enough. Well, if I have to take the responsibility, then I claim the authority to. I did good. We are all the sum of our tears. Too little and the ground is not fertile. And nothing can grow there. Too much, the best of us is washed away. My rains have come and gone. Yours are just beginning. Hard times, we suffer, we lose loved ones, we will lose some friends and gain new ones. The road is never easy. It was never meant to be easy. Enjoy them for what they are. And remember them for what they were. I don't know if you realize, you know, uh, it's hard enough acting, uh, like normal acting, but to act through pounds of rubber and, and red contact lenses. And I had a scene with him, and I really had never interacted with him. I, you know, I was in scenes with him. I had one line or two lines. Uh, I know Peter and I, as characters, talked about him a lot, and Peter hated him, and I said, oh, he's not so bad. And then, of course, I get in trouble with Peter, uh, Orlando. But I had a scene with uh, Andreas that just blew my mind. It was just a, you know, a, a scene where we were in an elevator together, and my race was, you know, the the kind of the Nazis of his race, and, uh, you know, it, I, the character was very uncomfortable as as Veer was, and Andreas cuts his hand, and every drop of blood. He said the word dead, you know, and he was counting the people that my race had killed and he was going dead 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 with his red eyes just glaring at me and the powerfulness that came from him you know when they would say cut you know i would go andreas i'm so sorry <laughs> you know and it was just it just i mean oh my lord he was such an amazing actor and it just you know it affects me today to, to recall that scene and to be, you know, lucky enough to act with Andreas Katsoulis. So. Uh, I'd like to share a, a, a real quick Andreas thought. It's, it's a sad and a happy memory. When you work on a show for five years, there's a, a lot of life that, that goes on. My daughter Liliana was born during the second season of Babylon 5, and my father passed away. Uh, during the fourth season of Babylon 5 and production was very kind and generous to I worked the day my dad died for 12 hours which was very weird but uh, the following episode there was a scene where Lanier had uh, sacrificed himself to save Londo from death and was in a coma and the cast members various cast members came to med lab to talk to Lanier while he was in a coma well, they filmed that scene on the day that my father was buried, and uh, generously, I w wasn't there for that scene. I was at my father's funeral, but they made a, a cast of Lanier's face and put it on a dummy with the, the, the makeup and everything, and that's what lay there. Andreas was not working that day, but when the episode aired, he came to me in the makeup room, and he said, I watched the show last night. And I want to tell you, you were brilliant. <laughs> but he was really serious to me. He said, to, to, to remain so still <laughs> is, is truly a great acting job. And I wanted to tell you, I was very moved by it. I didn't say anything. I said, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Andreas. <laughs> and I just remembered that now when you said I that. I would Steve. like to say something about Jeff Conaway. He and I had been friends had been friends since 1981. 
and we were very close friends. I used to go shopping for his wife for Christmas. He'd go, yeah, she likes what you like. Get her something and I'll give you the money back. <laughs> and, and I said, but she's real fair and I'm not. And, and he'd go, just, well, then you can figure it out. Just do it. And I, I just want to say to, and make it perfectly clear that Jeff Conaway was not the person that they portrayed on Celebrity Rehab. He was a good man and his pain was brought on by a horrible back injury from all the dancing in the Broadway. And he, it was just a downward slide. And he was a good man. And I'll never forget him. Thank you. All I really have to say, and, and, and Tracy maybe uh, think of this as when I think of Andreas or I think of Jeff or I think of any of the people who have passed that I feel like it's really important to put these, all of these people uh, in the context of their whole lives, not just the way we knew them as actors on Babylon 5. They had full lives. They had lives before they came to Babylon 5 as actors um, and, um, and, and you know, they were whole people. And I just think it's important to remember them as uh, more than just, you folks have all their work to look at, but they, they had families and they had ups and downs and children. And I talked with Andreas' uh, family still, and a couple of days, uh, days ago, Kate said, oh, pl please remember my dad. I can't even talk about it, but you know, she said, please remember my dad at the convention. You know, and I thought, and I wrote to her and I said to her last night, Andreas, and... Um I, I, with how much affection and love and joy people have, you know, and it's just important to remember that they had families and they were whole people. That's all I have to say. You know, that's, that's, I, I think one of the most gracious things that you guys have done is to keep all of these people's memories alive. And, and I think that that's a huge shout out to you. I've seen compilation, beautiful memorials about Zathras and Tim Choate, who died so young and so tragically and lost, you know, left little children behind. And there's some people that would make these videos for their families. You've sent notes to Lori Biggs. She has a very active uh, Facebook life. And everybody's been so supportive in, in everything, whether it's death or tragedy or whatever we've all gone through. You guys are the best. And I just want to say thank you to all of you. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. I've, uh, I've probably lived with more cast members than anyone in the cast. Well, he said he fucked him. <laughs> <And> <laughs> <laughs> well, he, well, he, no, he, he did. He lived with Bruce. He lived with uh, Andreas. I lived with Bruce. I lived with Andreas. I lived yeah. with Andrea. Yeah. Anybody else I miss? <laughs> Walter? No? No, I'm offering. It wasn't a look back. And that's why I'm saying um, no, thank God. We're all kissing Walter as we leave today. Exactly. Um, we were kind of like all just different ships that met at night in a marker where we were all tacking to the same point and we all got together for this thing called Babylon 5. And as, as you pointed out, you know, we've watched people get married and have kids and, and we're not um, separate from you or you separate from us because We've all been on this like really wild 20 year kind of ride since 1993 where, you know, we know about what's going on in your world and you know about what's going on in our world. And it's, it's been a very cool, you know, kind of a, an, an exchange because, you know, we see the same people and we meet new people and we hear about the good and the bad and the ups and the downs. And, you know, we're just all in this great cosmic clusterfuck together. And, uh, you know, we just, you got to keep our elbows out and say, this is our space, don't fuck with it. And uh, as long as we got a shot, as long as we're here, as long as we wake up in the morning, you know, we're ahead of the game. So, you know, I don't know what's going to happen tonight, but take advantage of it as long as we have the opportunity to do it. Yeah. Jer Jerry, to, um, to continue in your vibe of lightening the mood a bit, um, I was once at Jerry's house with Bruce, and this is how pathetic we are. We were watching Galaxy Quest together, okay? For the fourth time. 
that's not pathetic. That was our life. <laughs> I know. And and another time, I was thinking, it, well, no, first, Jerry, I can tell you why Jerry's had so many roommates. He's OCD neat. And because he knew I was from Texas and I drank iced tea, he had made me some, very sweetly, some big pitcher of iced tea to have during Galaxy Quest. And um, I got up to go to the ladies' room, and when I came back, my tea, my everything was cleaned up. The, 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 I said, I was gonna have some more tea, where is it? And he goes, I, I already washed it and put it away. <laughs> I'm like, dude, get a life. <laughs> So, it's a gift. So, uh, Pat, you want to talk, talk about the elevator scene with you and, and Rick and, and Jeff? Oh, Jeff. I, well, I guess the, we uh, in third space, there's an elevator scene with Jeff and I. And um, you, you, we were short, like three minutes or something like that. And so uh, Joe let Jeff and I know that we that day or that evening where we receive our, we, in the day, we get faxes. Uh, of a new scene we were going to shoot the next morning, first scene next morning, and um, it was basically a three-page monologue for Conaway, and I'm just, oh, I just talked to myself because I'm possessed by Vorlons or something, and <laughs> again, and <laughs> and uh, Jeff showed up that morning. Um, are you bruised? <laughs> He showed up that morning and did the scene word perfect, three pages, single space, and he got an applause from the crew. He was word perfect. He was amazing. And that's the kind of performer Jeff was. He was just, a, you know, just amazing, amazing. And we had to do it a couple different times for different angles, and he was perfect every time. We probably shot that entire scene in a half an hour. We were in and out. He was incredible. There was a lot of weird stuff that went on behind the scenes that no one will ever really know. Some of the weird B5 synchronicities that went on for quite a while, where so we, I wrote a scene where the voice of the resistance is speaking from Babylon 5 and saying we don't have power to broadcast. Do you remember what happened in that scene? Um, we, we lost power at, at the stages. And we had to bring in a generator. We didn't have power to make that scene about not having power. <laughs> I wrote a script, again with Claudia, where she says in the, the, the episode about the Drazi, I have a great relationship. It's, it's like talking to my left foot, but I have a good relationship with my left foot. What happened the day before we shot that scene? I broke my left foot. <laughs> <laughs> Daniel Day-Lewis has nothing on you. Daniel Day-Lewis has only foot. three Academy Awards on me. Um, no, the funniest thing was, was uh, you know, I, I, I was so in pain, and I was so, I was so Ivanova when I went to the doctor, because I said, I gotta work tomorrow. Pop it back in the socket, stat. JMS is gonna be pissed off. He's gotta rewrite something. So now, now in the meantime, a nurse sneaks up behind me and fills me full of Demerol because I was out of control. So now I'm suddenly really happy. I get home and I'm calling Copeland and and I don't even remember who I spoke to, but I, I was like, and, and I think he first at first he thought that maybe it was a sprain or something that we'll, we can hide. I said, no, it's like three bones and an ankle. It's basically crushed. What the hell were you doing, Claudia? I said, I was watching the three tenors. And it was the break during the three tenors, and I felt really happy from the three tenors, and I sort of was jumping around the garden. It was a garden accident. It was, it was, it was the most embarrassing thing, because I really wanted to do something macho, like a motorcycle accident, or, Jerry, how did you break your shoulder again? Uh, which one? Which yeah, time? The, the, the one that you actually did tell them about. The one when I fell out of the bed in the hospital? No, during, during the show. Oh, during the show, I broke during, my arm. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's another synchronicity, yeah. too, because as I recall, it was during Severed Dreams, yeah. and you fell, and, or someone walked over, and you broke your arm. Yeah. So the next episode, I have a, the script's written ahead of time, and there's a you line that you have, there's a character talking to someone, would you break your arm or something? And he came into my office to complain, thinking I was making fun of his broken arm. Yeah. But that, I point, if you read, read the date on the script, it was like a week beforehand that I wrote this. Wow, yeah. It's yeah. Like your fault. Well, <laughs> I was talking to Bruce back when we were still maker. making the show about this, and I said, well, well you're in luck, Bruce. I, I, I cut out the scene where Sheridan has his dick cut off accidentally. <laughs> and on that note? He, he paled. <laughs> he went dead white. It was wonderful. 
<laughs> on that note. We, we, uh, went, we were shooting this stunt, and it, and it kind of went bad, and I ended up busting my arm, and then I'm laying on the ground, and I'm sweating, and I didn't know if I was going to puke or shit my pants or, or, or both. And the director says to me, he says, you okay? I go, I'm not this good an actor. So I think I broke my arm. He goes, well, you got a problem. I go, we? He said, we missed it. Kid you not, we shot it again. With my arm was like taped to the gun instead of swinging again. And it went bad again. And I hit the deck a second time. And he goes, we just need one more piece. Just one more piece. And, he's, and I, he says, stand against the wall. You'll slide down. Jeff will come in. He'll help you. And he goes, use that exact look. So I'm all blood and this rabbit shit, you know, from the scene. And then who was the guy, the gangbanger that was working in the front office? He was all tatted out. Oh, oh yeah, the gangbanger. The gangbanger, yeah, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Doug. So, so yeah, Doug Netter. <laughs> and he'd, he'd bang anybody. He didn't. Yeah. Oh. So this gangbanger, he drives me to the emergency room at uh, the Cedar sinai Hotel in a four-door Mercedes. He's all tatted out, but he looks like a gangbanger. And we pull up, and in the hospitals in LA, if the gangbangers don't kill each other, they go to the hospital to finish the job. <laughs> so there's cops there. So I get out of the car in the, in the passenger side, busted arm, busted wrist, writhing in pain, but I have all my battle fatigues, and I got, <laughs> I got blood all over me from the scene. Fake blood, crusted fucking ear, you know, blah, blah, blah. And he gets out of the driver's scene, and there's cops there. And the cops are like. <laughs> so as I'm walking into ER, I look at a cop, and I go, he carjacked me, but he was kind enough to drive me to the emergency room. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, what the fuck, Holmes? And I go, I'll be inside. So I go in and I go, look, I am not, I don't have a lot of time for this. I'm not good with pain. I need some narcotics. And, uh, and then Andrea came uh, like 20 minutes later and yeah, you, you I, come I running in. I got in a phone call that, that you were on your way to the emergency room and that I should rush over. And so I'm trying to find them. And they said, well, I said, his name is Jerry Doyle. And, and they weren't sure who I was looking for. And, and I said, well, he's a, he's a very tall man. He's wearing uh, like a, a sci-fi uniform and a lot of makeup. And they said, oh, we get loads of those here. <laughs> <laughs> At this moment in time, I have to cut in. I'm sorry. But we have a very special video presentation. Some people won't even believe that I ever existed. I don't think I mind that, not at all, really. It's what we all want, isn't it? To become something larger than ourselves, to enter living memory, have them talk about us when we've gone. Might as well. They talk about us enough when we're living. the last living thing that you are ever going to see. Kill my son! Answer me! Answer me! You gonna hurt me? I hope you go to hell. You are not my father. And the breath I take after I kill you will be the first breath of my life. There is no greater power in the universe than the need for freedom. Against that power, Governments, and tyrants, and armies cannot stand. Though it take a thousand years, we will be free. Are 
used to always tell him, you never start a fight. Always finish it. contributions in popular culture through television, film, and comic books, Mr. John Edwards of the Arizona Popular Culture Experience. I'm sorry you had to see that. I did not know this was going to happen. Swell. <laughs> well, as you can see from the last short film there, Mr. Straczynski has enlightened us, educated us, entertained us, and inspired us. He has brought a wonderful group of people together for a long time that we've all appreciated with a great story that continues on forever. It is my pleasure to present the Lifetime Achievement Award to J. Michael Straczynski, and we expect many more achievements. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What I'd like to do, that looks like a Starfleet symbol if you ask me, <laughs> um, is A, dedicate this to uh, our absent friends and memory is still very bright. Um, and we are almost out of time, I believe. I want to allow everyone here to sort of have their last words talking about themselves or the convention or anything you want to talk about to say goodbye to this great assemblage of talent uh, from today and Parting comments. Jason, starting with you. Okay. Well, I, I just want to make a comment to Phoenix Comic Con for the excellent hospitality. This is about the best, most friendly con I've ever been to. And so I, I would like to thank you. I, I also just want to say that uh, Babylon 5 was um, absolutely crucial in affecting my life in a profoundly wonderful way. And I'm very grateful for being involved with all the people who were part of it. Thank you. And I love you! And I want to thank you for your loyalty. Um, you've watched everyone's career. You've been so gracious about tuning in and watching them, you know, blossom as talents and, you know, supporting our music or supporting other things we're doing. And I want to thank you for that and, you know, for putting my son through college by buying his sleeves this weekend. And <laughs> thank you so much for your hospitality. Truly, truly gracious, gracious Phoenix. Thank you very much. Uh, I, first of all, would like to thank all of you for coming out, and again, it's a, a wonderful experience this weekend. Um, I would like to thank uh, Joe for writing an amazing character for me and for the rest of the cast for uh, welcoming um, uh, me in in the, uh, in the fifth season. And uh, it was my first television performance. I, I learned a lot working on the show with all of you, and it was uh, a great pleasure, and I've enjoyed all of the following years, and I, I feel very proud to be a part of uh, this family. Thank you. Actually, I, I want to give up my time to Claudia, who was in the middle of a story when she was interrupted, and we never got back to hear the rest of it. <laughs> she was, she's not listening. She's asleep. It's okay. Claudia. I'm, I'm, not, I'm right here. No, Claudia. I don't know what story it was. Walter? I, I don't, I don't think I, they don't care, Walter. They've heard them all so many times. <laughs> She's got a great book. It's in there. <laughs> God bless you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Okay, I, I want to say that. Back down again. Okay. This Can is a I, normal I, Babylon 5 reaction. When someone starts to tell a story, we sit. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I, I want to say that Babylon 5 happened uh, 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 to me in, in, at a time when, when my life uh, went through an incredible rupture. Uh, when I felt broken as a, as a person uh, <laughs> and that it lifted me uh, to something completely different, to another life. Uh, and I cannot, um, I don't have words to appreciate it, uh, to, to, to uh, express my appreciation for that. Um, uh, uh, so that's that. <laughs> I'm incredibly grateful uh, for that, for the character that I got to play, and for the five years with these incredible people that stayed my friends. I miss Andreas every day. I miss Rick every day. Tim Choate was also my friend, a very close friend of mine. Uh, Michael O'Hare, whatever he was and however he was, he was uh, somehow connected with that beginning of my new life in America. Uh, I cannot get over the loss of those people. Um, um, Richard Compton, who, who cast me in this, in this role, uh, who was crucial uh, for what happened to me, um, I, I, I mean, um, the loss is unbelievable, <laughs> and they're they're here, they're here. Um, um, in my, it's so pathetic, it's so stupid to say that, in my heart, but it's really true. It's really true. We carry them on, we carry them, and they live on with us, in us. Um, so uh, th that's that. As, as far as this convention uh, um, uh, goes, I mean, I, I've never been, I totally agree with Jason, it's the most friendly, the most caring, and the most kind and somehow human convention I've been to, and I, I truly appreciate it, you know, all the organizers and so on. Every little detail functioned, clicked, and was perfect. Thank you for organizing this. I think we needed it. We needed to get together. We needed some kind of closure and some kind of emotional bonding after so many years because many things happened that were not so great and so on and so forth. And now somehow I feel that we, we came through it and we're on the other side and I'm, I'm so happy about it. Um, I'm so glad to see every, every, every and each one of you. <laughs> <laughs> really, I'm Even truly, truly happy for that. Um, and I thank you, of course, I can't thank you enough because you were crucial for our survival and uh, this new family that, that, we, that we achieved uh, with Babylon 5. Thank you and thank you. <laughs> That's beautiful, Mira. Life-changing experience, Joe. It was a lot of fun. You get a few of them every now and again. Uh, you might have heard some rumors that I was in a little coma about three years ago. Well, it's true. Uh, if your friends say you look like shit, go to the doctor. Um, I was in a coma, life support, multiple organ failure, uh, stop breathing, uh, last rites, call the family, fly him out, he's going to die. And uh, I showed them. When I came out of the coma, uh, was, I don't know how long it was, a week and a half, something like that. Um, I didn't know where I was. I thought maybe I just had a couple of drinks and dozed off somewhere. And uh, I knew I had to go to the bathroom, so I attempted to do that and uh, ended up wiping out uh, and broke my neck and my shoulder. And uh, people said, wow, you had a pretty shitty year. And I said, not really, because I'm still here. And... Another life-changing experience. Um, since that day, three years ago, I have not missed a sunrise. And I remember your character used to do the same after John Sheridan passed on. I'm pretty sure the sun is gonna come up tomorrow. I know if it does, I'm gonna be there. And my point is, we don't know when it's over. But as long as we got today, and you got a choice, why would you choose to make it a bad day? Here, here.
How am I supposed to follow Mira and Jerry after that? Lighten yeah, lighten it up. Okay. Um, ditto. I'll say ditto for what you said, and thank you for saying what you said. Uh, we are very lucky to be here, and we're lucky that you're, um, you're here with us. And this has been very healing, Mira. I agree. I mean, I was thinking about that in a lot of ways this weekend. So thank you, and thank you for your hospitality. Um, and thank you, Joe, for giving this to us. And I, I, really, I, I love all you guys, and you know that. I'm, I'm so glad you're here. Okay, and Claudia and I will be making out later. Yes, definitely. <laughs> Can We're I always join? at the Renaissance. <laughs> Top that, sister. <laughs> the twosome became a threesome. <laughs> Woo! Um, you know, it's, it's phenomenal to me to look around and, and to have met all the, the people that I've met at this convention and to see everybody again after all these years. We're surrounded these days by content, bombarded with all kinds of different things that, that want to pull our attention. And it's really a testament to how special and amazing Babylon 5 is that it endures through all these years, through all these decades, and that you can go back and watch it, and it's every bit as relevant, it's, it's every bit as poignant and, and wonderful as it was when it was first first created, and it, it's just, um, uh, it, it's humbling to be a part of, of something this wonderful and, um, and does truly feel like another family. Yes. So thank you, thank you so much. I always love the uh, the work when the work is good, and uh, on this show, I guess uh, it's appropriate. I, I feel like I've said it so many times that I'm going to say it again and say it aloud. This seems like the time to say it, to uh, to thank Joe for this uh, incredible ride, this wonderful character I got to play, to uh, all the words that you gave me to say, and I thank you for. I always love great writing, but I had great writing here, and that makes the work. Uh, so worthwhile, the, the work that's all it's about. And then to have these people as um, fellow actors, you know, and then we include Andreas and everybody who's not here. Uh, you know, the work was just, um, it was fabulous to do and great to do, and then to have friendships among these people too, uh, uh, you know, just, uh, it just got better and better. And then who knew when I took this show that I would inherit all of you and this world, fandom, and uh, the love that you people continue to give. So uh, I thank you, and I thank you, my fellow actors, and I thank you, Joe, for this wonderful experience. Thank you. Uh, yeah, you know, best job ever. I mean, I used to be thrilled to come to work, and, and every single day, what a crew, what a cast, what dialogue, what writing, what acting, um, what a job. I can't think of any other role where somebody comes up to me and says, you helped me come out of the closet. Uh, you, I watched the show when my mother was dying in the hospital with her because that's how we bonded. These are the things people tell me. I mean, you know, your, your character made me strive to become the commander instead of the secretary. <laughs> you know, um, people, I went into the military because of you guys. We, I went through the military and, 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 and thought, what would Ivanova or Sheridan do? I mean, these are things that you're never going to hear from another job ever again in your life. So thank you, Joe, for writing such an amazing character. And personally, I've never, ever remained friends with any, any people like I have on this show. I love all of you very much. Thank you kindly to oh, the I'm sorry. Phoenix thank you, Comic Arizona, Con. Too. Yeah, it was a great, sorry. I got all emotional and I got weepy. I ditto everything that Mira said and every, this is the best con ever, I swear. <laughs> no, the people are amazing. Everybody's been nice and every detail's been attended to. You didn't even have to chase anybody down for per diem. What a godsend. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> thank you kindly, Phoenix Comic Con. Uh, regarding Babylon 5. It's just a TV show, but it's a real good TV show. One thing we all have in common here, we like 
to fantasize. We enjoy science fiction. I would encourage you all to remember, for the time being, this is the only planet that we have. So do your best to take care of Mother Earth. Respect all the living things on it. And we'll be here tomorrow. <laughs> we'll be back tomorrow, so we'll see you then. Thank you kindly. I'd like to say, as a lifelong sci-fi fan and reader of sci-fi, um, just because somebody plays a sexy part on TV or wears some slutty costume, it, I was bullied in school. I played competitive chess. I had a 3D chess like Mr. Spock. And as soon as that came out, I was like, mm-hmm, <laughs> who's cool now? And so for me, getting this part was, it was like Disneyland squared. And, um, and although it hurt me when the fans initially didn't accept me, it, it's okay, I understand, because when I first watched me, I went, shit, who's that new bitch? Oh, I... <laughs> and I went, oh, wait a minute, I gotta like her, it's me. <laughs> and, um, and I think Joe did some amazing writing that caught, that w again, with life paralleling art, in that the, the, the station didn't trust her, the fans didn't trust her, and gradually, I hope, people came around. Thank you. I, uh, I, um, I hated all the sexy costumes I had to wear as well. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I, I gotta say, in regards to the convention, it's you know, top notch, well organized. Just, I love the fans here. You guys were so, you know, wonderful. You know, some fans can be slightly overbearing, you know, and, but um, you guys were all wonderful and everything. To Joe, uh, I, I gotta say, I, I thank you immensely uh, for writing the words to act, but also writing wonderful episodes for me to direct. And, there's something I don't even think you know. Something about Babylon 5 you don't know. Uh -oh. <laughs> you actually uh, kind of saved my life. What happened was um, I've been a diabetic for almost 50 years. And I went into uh, kidney failure. And I had to be put on dialysis, which is really not fun. And the average life of somebody on dialysis is seven years. And it was, it got out somehow, and it was on the internet that Stephen first needed a kidney and everything. And a Babylon 5 fan got in touch through a third party and said that we, I loved your character on Babylon 5, and I loved the show so much. I want to give you my kidney one of my kidneys. And to this day, I know his name is Mark. He was 39 years old. Uh, he, was, he donated one of his kidneys to me because he was a Babylon 5 fan. And the only thing I could say when this happened was, <laughs> Oh boy, is this great. I'd like to thank our moderators that uh, were also overbearing and alpha personalities that didn't get to do what they wanted to do, but thank you very much, you're wonderful. Speaking as... When you, when you write a show, you hope that you will have the opportunity to, to see your words to survive at all in any way, manner, shape, or form let alone brought to life by a, a cast as extraordinary as this, by a crew as extraordinary as we had that worked <clears throat> overtime to make the show look good. We had like no money to make the show, but they busted their butts. I want to recognize the crew for having done that. 
the cast from having come to work with, everyone always do their lines. In fact, there was one actor who showed up who didn't know his lines, was a guest actor. I understand you took him behind one of the sets and, as they say, had words with him. I was there, he decked him. And you, you know that this experience will never come again, and it never has. There are other shows, other projects, but nothing along the lines of what this was. We were a band of misfits, all of us. You know, it was the island of broken toys in many respects. But we bonded together and worked together. And I owe everyone here a tremendous debt of gratitude, as well as to the, the fans across the world here in Phoenix. And what, if there's any thought that I would send out to you, and yesterday I mentioned that when Andreas knew that he was leaving us, uh, he called for a last dinner, a last supper. Uh, it was Peter and myself and uh, Doug Netter, uh, other producer, which proves that he had, it was delusional, it was last days, and had no taste whatsoever. <laughs> and we had dinner, and Andreas said, tell me all the dirt I never knew, which we, of course, as he said at the time, who am I going to tell? Yeah. Um, and knowing that he was on his last legs, and on the way out the door, as we all walked out, he stopped each one of us and that there was a pause that he looked in our eyes and, and we knew that it was the last time we were going to be seeing each other. And, I, I, and, put it, and hugged us and I'll never forget that look of saying, I appreciate this moment. I appreciate you in my life and whatever that happens to be. And what I would say to you as you go not just here, but when you go home as well. Look to those around you. Look to these people. Look to your friends, to your family. With that look, with that understanding that this moment is just here for the moment, that this day will never come again, to tell those you love what you feel about them, what you care about them, and hold on to them and be generous with your kindness, generous with your words, generous with your gestures. And to do that in memory of Andreas, in memory of Babylon 5, and on behalf of everyone up here, thank you for your support over the years, for your, for your own kindness, for your own gestures, for your own compassion. It has meant the world to us. Thank you. Let's hear it one more time for the cast and creator of Babylon 5. We would like to tell you that when exiting, if you can please kindly use the side exits.
something worth dying for? Do you have anything worth living for? There is no greater power in the universe than the need for freedom. Against that power, governments and tyrants and armies cannot stand. Though it take a thousand years, we will be 